Hello everyone, and welcome to this crash course on the CamWorks Universal Post Generator, or UPG. My name is Austin Popejoy. I'm the Cam Application Engineer at GSC, a reseller of both SOLIDWORKS and CamWorks products. As I said earlier, this is an introduction to using the CamWorks Universal Post Generator, which is a free download. With this tool, you can make changes to the post processes that are used for both SOLIDWORKS Cam and CamWorks applications. I think it's one of the easiest platforms out there to learn for creating custom post processors, but it still does involve some computer scripting, so a background in some sort of programming is generally beneficial. Now, it is by no means the only way to modify posts, and most professional post writers will make their changes using another text editing application such as CamWorks EC Editor, Visual Studio Code, or even Notepad. However, at a minimum, the resulting source files will have to be compiled using UPG, so you'll need to have it installed if you want to make any posting changes. A post processor consists of, at a minimum, the encrypted .ctl and .lng files. There may be other files that contain additional information, but the CTL and LNG files allow the CAM program to translate movements into your machine's native language. In order to generate those posts, we need the source file, or .src. These are what control the output code when a post processor is created. Without the .src files, you have no control over the CTL and LNG. If you're using a custom post already, you may or may not have access to those SRC files, so you should determine that first. Just like SOLIDWORKS CAM and CAMWORKS include a variety of post processors during installation, the UPG comes with a wide variety of source files to use as starting points for your machine family. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. For now, let's launch a UPG and start looking around. And here we can see the Universal Post Generator in all its glory. The interface may look a little outdated, but this release is version 2 from November 2020, so don't let the graphics fool you, it is relatively new. If we wanted to create a new post processor, we could do so by selecting the New button, and then choosing the type of machine we're programming, and the controller detailers that give us the framework to start with. In most instances though, you're going to have a starting point already with the .src file. In order to use that as our basis, we click the Open button. In addition to using external .src files, when the UPG is installed, it includes over 50 source files for milling machines, over 30 lathe variations, and a dozen mill turn machines, which are organized in the respective folders. From the mill source templates, we'll select a generic 3x Finux source file, and the UPG will relaunch. And looking at the UPG now, we can see we have a series of headings across the top that cover the different machine phases. There's a middle section that allows the user to change the options of various sections under the heading, and a display of computer code below that is actually what generates the instructions for the post processor. For instance, we see the first line is for the machine name, which is defined as all, and there's an associated line in the machine code portion that says ATTR short for attribute short name, and changing the line above changes the default value for our machine name. The next tab covers the header options. These are controls over the general formatting of the G code generated that are defined before any of the CAN commands are taken into account. This includes whether or not there are leading or trailing zeros, how many decimal places to use, and whether to define arcs using the I and J method or a radius value. If your machine cannot handle full 360 degree turns, you can set those limits here. For instance, some older mini mills can only handle 180 degree arcs, so you check this radio button here. Moving over to the miscellaneous section, you can toggle a lot of options, such as whether this post is only valid for three axes. If not, you can select below which other axes are available. You can also enable CamWorks new probing cycles here, though some additional variables need to be added to other files. See your CamWorks reseller for more details. Moving on to the miscellaneous tab, you can toggle additional options for your G-code formatting. The most common one is controlling the line numbering scheme, otherwise known as end numbers. You can have end numbers put on each line in several different formats, as well as by tool number, operation, or omitted completely. You can also control the maximum number before the count starts over and the size of incremental increase. There are many other post processor commands that don't fit well in any other section, such as preloading the first tool after the last tool change of a program, which decreases the amount of time necessary to get the next cycle started. One particular handy option is the output debug. If you need to focus on changing a particular line of a program but aren't sure which segment of the post created it, toggling output debug on will create tags on each line of code so you know for sure where to inspect to make the necessary changes. Once those changes are made, be sure to toggle output debug back off so your production code doesn't have section tags on it. The next several tabs control what options are available when doing a particular type of cutting. For instance, with two-day milling, within pocketing, you can choose to add absolute or incremental options, coolant controls, or other selections. 
Note these are not set in the controls themselves, just turning on or off whether the user is prompted to select them from within the control operations. The tabs for 3D milling, drilling and tapping, and boring operations all work similarly. The Setup tab controls which entry slots are available within the machine definition controls of CamWorks. These are then set as variables that can be accessed to pull the data so it can be displayed within any given program. You can see some of these boxes already checked, such as program number, with a default value of 1. If you also want the name of the program to be available as a variable, you can check that here. If we check the box for programmer, we can see it alters the setup computer code, adding the variable for programmer. These setup variables can be really useful for clearly labeling which customer or project a program is being used for, which material is being made out of, or a host of other tracking values. The Post Operations tab controls what options a programmer can add through the Post Operations window in CamWorks. The most common are for stops, M00 and M01, though additional M and G codes can be added through more in-depth modifications we're going to cover here today. The last tab, Sections, is the actual meat and potatoes of the UPG. Everything up to this point has been setting up variables and options, but the Sections tab is where all those are brought together to actually generate the code. You can click on a section heading, then choose the area that you're interested in from the section list. In this case, we'll go with miscellaneous, then choose start of tape, which is the first portion of the post process that's brought up. Looking at the code itself, it looks substantially different than what we saw in the previous tabs. Like I said before, those set the variables and this portion is what actually calls them up. If you have experience in another coding language, such as C+, much of this will probably look familiar. If we look at the code in front of us, there are a couple things that should immediately stand out. Each line begins with a colon T colon and ends with an EOL in brackets. These commands tell the post processor when a new line starts and ends respectively. Look at the first line after colon T colon, we have the letter O outside of any brackets. This tells the post processor to simply put that text into the output. After that, there is a string that is contained in brackets. The brackets signify a variable is being called from another section, in this case, program number. The 4LT before the variable name indicates the output will be a four digit number with leading and trailing zeros included. Look in the second line, after our colon T colon, we see an N in brackets. This looks at the settings chosen in our miscellaneous tab, and if an N number format was selected, it will insert one here. Notice the first line did not have this callout, so the program number line will never have a line number. After the N, we see another variable being called out, G17 again in brackets. This looks at our XY plane and inserts the G17 if that value isn't already modal. If it is, that will be ignored. After that, we see another variable call out, but this one is slightly different. It looks at the variable called ENGMET to determine if the coding is being done in inches or millimeters and will output a G20 or G21 respectively. However, the exclamation mark after the G annotation forces this code to be output regardless of whether it is modal or not. Most times it makes sense to reduce duplicate commands to shorten the code and make it easier to read. However, on something critical like this, you can force the code to be generated regardless by using the exclamation mark. This line also forces an output of G40 and G80 to cancel tool compensation and any can cycles that are active from previous operations, ensuring we're starting with a clean slate. To make changes to the output of this section, we can simply type them into this window. For instance, if we want to output a text line before anything else, we can type it in place, making sure to start out with colon T colon and end with our bracketed EOL. No other annotation is needed since it isn't referencing any variables. We would then continue through each portion of the sections tab, making any necessary changes. If we want to modify the code generated for our tool changes, we can click that section. There are four subsections in the list for tool changes, and they represent the initial tool change and preloading, as well as any subsequent tool changes and preloading. In this case, the preloads are blank because our hypothetical machine doesn't have that capability. If you want to make changes, but you're not the greatest typist like me, you can go to the section you want to modify and then use many of the buttons in the lower block to insert various commands. You'll understand the benefit of this if you've ever had to debug a massive program looking for that stray comma that was accidentally inserted. Before we compile the code, which creates the post processor, we'll want to save the source file. I prefer using save as to prevent overriding the original version and give it a memorable name. I recommend using version numbers, dates, or whatever else helps you keep track of your work as it progresses. We are now ready to generate our post processor by going to File, Compile Post. In this window, we'll need to select the source file we wish to compile. As I said in the opening, you still need to use the UPG to compile the source file, even if it was added in another program. If you use that route, you can simply choose the source file from this list without even having it open in the UPG. 
If you've done everything properly, when you click the compile button, you should get a successful message letting you know the post was created. The default location for these files is C colon, CamWorks data, UPG2, CTL, but that can be changed in the preferences. To try our changes, let's go to SOLIDWORKS with CamWorks or, in this case, SOLIDWORKS CAM loaded. Under the machine definition window, we can choose our new post processor, making sure to click the select button. Note, if we make a change to the source file and recompile it, you need to choose another post processor from this list, click select, then reselect your modified post processor so it reloads itself into memory with your changes. We can now run this program through the post processor and observe the results using the powerful CamWorks NC editor. And we can see now the new comment line we added to the start of tape is displayed at the beginning of our program just as we expected. We've now successfully made our changes to the post processor and are getting the output we want. Of course, this brief session is not enough to make you an expert in the UPG, its operation, or post processing in general but you now have a foundation to start exploring, especially when combined with additional resources such as a CamWorks Post Writer's Reference Manual. If you have any additional questions, please feel free to reach out to your CAM experts at GSC. Thank you very much for your time and have a great day.